Today we will be reading week nine, day three of our plant cells book. We will be starting at page 38 and reading to the end of the book. How do plants get rid of waste? Plants eat, drink, and breathe, just like you. But they have their own ways of doing it. And like you, they produce waste. Plants do not take in solid food, only gases, water, and nutrients. As a result, their waste products are only gases, water in the form of water vapor, and waste chemicals. As plants produce waste, cells store that waste in central vacuoles. As water moves in and out of plant cells, it mixes with chemical waste. Plant cells get rid of water vapor and chemical waste through their pores. Here is the central vacuole inside that cell. Notice how large it is. Very different from the animal cell in which the central vacuole is multiple small round circles. Here we have one large section that takes up almost the entire cell. A central vacuole is like the plant cell's dustbin or trash can. Osmosis. Plants rely on a process called osmosis to move water into a root from the soil. Osmosis is the flow of liquids or gases through membranes. It allows water to move into and out of plant cells. Transpiration. Water must then move up into the leaves. The process of moving water from the roots to pass through the leaves is transpiration. Think of a plant stem like a straw. The water starts in the soil. Cells that have the least water suck up water through the roots. Water moves from cells that have more water up to the plant's stem and into the cells in leaves. The water in leaf cells is used in photosynthesis, which means that leaf cells always have a need for more water. Water, water everywhere. Leaves release massive amounts of water vapor. An acre of corn, for example, releases from 11,400 to 15,100 liters of water vapor per day. A large oak tree transpires more than 150,000 liters of water per year. Water enters the plant through its roots. It is expelled from leaves as water vapor. Getting rid of waste. In addition to transpiration, plants have other ways to get rid of waste. Some plants actively pass waste chemicals back into the soil. When plants compete for space, they can drop toxins into the soil to kill off pushy neighbors. Another way to get rid of waste is to get rid of the plant parts that store waste. Flowers that grow from bulbs, such as tulips and daffodils, shed their stalks. The stalks die, getting rid of plant waste and leaving the bulb underground to produce a new flower the next year. Here we have some leaves. When these autumn leaves fall, they take cell waste products with them. So the trees are getting rid of their waste by dropping their leaves. Losing leaves and other waste. In the autumn, leaves on deciduous trees, trees that shed their leaves, change color and fall off. Trees absorb metals, 
such as lead and cadmium through their roots. These metals are called heavy metals and are toxic to plants and animals, plants and humans. Plant cells move the metals into vacuoles in the cells of their leaves. The metals in part determine the colors of autumn leaves. Tropical trees do not drop their leaves in autumn. They get rid of chemical waste in gums, raisins, and saps. Sometimes trees do not get rid of their waste. They store it in cells in the center of the trunk. The waste chemicals cause the wood in the trunk to turn a dark color. The wood is called ebony or a hard black wood called heartwood. Ebony and heartwood stop using water and minerals. They serve as a storage for some wastes and prevent them from spreading into the rest of the plant. Here is some raisin on the side of a tree that resin is one way that a tropical tree can get rid of itself or rid itself of chemical waste. So if you've ever touched a tree and gotten sap on your fingers, that is waste from the tree being excreted. How do scientists work with plant cells? Ancient Egyptian farmers grew different types of wheat to increase the number of crops. Ancient people in Peru developed more than 3,000 varieties of potato. These cultures used biotechnology to find better ways to grow crops. Biotechnology uses living things as tools. Here is an example of biotechnology at work. Scientists identify a type of wheat that produces more grain than usual, but that wheat species gets diseased easily. Scientists also identify wheat that resists disease, but does not make much grain. They work with the two strands of wheat to produce a new wheat that resists the disease and yields plenty of grain. Plant scientists also use crossbreeding to develop new plant species. Crossbreeding mixes characteristics from two varieties of the same species. For example, crossbreeding allows a scientist to mix white roses and red roses to grow pink roses. It helped develop a bigger potato that is perfect for baking and ears of corn with nice straight rows of kernels. So when you think about people who talk about um, GMO, genetically modified um, objects, so GMO foods, it's actually a good thing because they're taking the bad things about one plant and the good things about another plant and they're kind of mixing them together. Scientist Spotlight, Norman Borlaug. In the 1960s, U.S. food scientist Norman Borlaug, 1914 to 2009, developed a short-stalked, high-yielding wheat that grows with very little water. For this new wheat, Borlaug won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. Since then, Borlaug's wheat has saved more than 225 million people from starvation. Think about grapes. People like the fruit, but not the seeds. Scientists took grapes with few seeds and crossed them with other grapes with few seeds. Eventually, new grape species produced seedless grapes. Nature makes these changes often. Scientists have found ways to give nature a hand. The result is more and better varieties of fruits, vegetables, and grains to feed an ever-growing human population. Here are some of those grapes. DNA in the cells of a seedless grape does not send the message for the plant to make seeds. And then one more picture. Biotechnology in this research center in India 
developed cotton plants that grew more cotton. <laughs> 